Okay. If this thing goes off, let me know. It's gone off twice. I don't know why. <clears throat> What's the last thing we studied? What? Well, that sucks. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't know. We just keep on having to select the source doc. You got a phone? Want the number? Eight. You got it? <laughs> yeah, I always call them up, though. 8450807. Uh, as long as I keep selecting the source, I don't know why it drops the source. Makes no sense. Ask it, tell them it's in room 118. If they got a chance, they're welcome to just come on into class, see if they can figure out why it's. I got to keep hitting doc cam because it goes off. Civil Engineering 118. I'll be darned. Yeah, but I got a student worker in here. I'll get him. That'll be fine. If you push a button. This is really strange, but better than not having class. Thank you. You want to grab a chair if you want to. Yeah. When it goes off, you just select source, document camera, and it turns back on. Okay. I don't get it. Okay. No. No, no, go right ahead. All right, we were talking about columns. Sorry for the delay. Um, columns fail by having so much load on them that they buckle. We have equations for the loads that it takes to buckle them. We have Mr. Euler's opinion, which is accurate up to some break point from which we find <clears throat> some of the fibers will go into the plastic region and of course when they all go to F sub Y his opinions aren't valid mainly because the fibers are no longer in the straight line portion of the stress strain diagram E. So the same problem happens locally. What we've done so far is what they call global buckling where the whole column buckles. But well, the second possibility is that these little stick-out pieces here, when you put a uniform stress across them, 
there's so much stress that they will personally buckle if they're too thin. <clears throat> so you have to check for local buckling as well as global buckling. The phenomena is very similar. Up to some point, these things won't buckle. They're just too short and they're too squatty. For instance, if you make me a wide flange that looks like that, then this piece is just not going to buckle locally. It's too thick and doesn't stick out far enough. Now, if that happens, the real reason the whole column fails is not that it's buckled. It may still be straight. Come on in. Yeah. Yeah, and they'll probably figure. We just have to keep on pushing the button that says what a uh, dock cam, and it comes right back up. May have to sit here how long? A minute? Two minutes? That's fine. Okay. This is my entourage, incidentally. Here, <laughs> we travel together. Um, there's two types of these things. One of these elements, like an element of a flange, is called an unstiffened element, means it is supported only on one edge. A stiffened element is one that's harder to buckle because it is attached at two edges. So they'll have different numbers whether or not it's an unstiffened or a stiffened element. Your personal column will be classified as either a slender or a non-slender column. If these little stick-out pieces have a tendency to buckle, then you have got what we call a non-slender column. The limit state will be caused when the local piece locally buckles, and the equations you've been using up to now won't apply. Now here's kind of what they look like. In at some breakpoint on these flanges and webs, they'll tell you what that breakpoint is. It depends on what it is and what it's attached to. If you are to the left of that point, you don't have to fiddle with it. Your equations that we've worked out so far work perfectly. On the other hand, if you exceed this break point, then you will have to reduce the load. You will get local buckling. There is a symbol that they use, just generic, and it's lambda. And that lambda is just something, you've got to call the thing something. So I say, are you above or below the break point? Are you above or below? the lambda value for your wide flange or for your channel or whatever you're working with. They give that the name lambda. Your personal value for your personal wide flange is just going to be listed as lambda. If you want to know where the break point is, it's subscripted with an R. Like the radius of gyration of the little piece that's sticking out is so small, but that's the, that's the break point. If you remember previously, we had a curve looked very much like this one for the column strength that came in at F sub Y, and it had a break point, above which Mr. Euler's equation with a .877 attached to take care of things like how straight the columns are when you buy them. <clears throat> and uh, an equation to the left, we have the same kind of a deal. You're going to have a break point. Your lambda, the way you calculate lambda, will be how far does the little piece stick out divided by how thick it is. And how far it sticks out <clears throat> and how thick it is is uh, dependent on are you talking about a channel, or are you talking about an angle, or are you talking about a wide flange. But there'll be a B over T ratio. For a wide flange or a T, this is what you and I have been calling B sub F. It's how far it sticks out in two directions. How far the flange sticks out is B sub F over 2. B sub F is out of the book. And then your T will be the T of the flange, and that's a measure of its susceptibility to local buckling. 
So you go get your wide flange and you calculate B sub F over 2 divided by its flange thickness and that will be your value. Your value is to be compared with the number that we have found below which, don't care, above which you have problems. This number, just like the number we found before, if you remember, Mr. Euler came in and was doing great. Right about this point, he wasn't doing so great. We had a break point. Above that break point, you used Euler's equation for the critical buckling stress, F sub E, but times 0.877. And then you had a different equation, uh, something raised to the power, raised to the something times F sub Y, below this break point. Well, you got break points in this kind of work all over the place. The break point for a wide flange is 0.56 times square root of E over F sub Y. And that may be the number for something else. We just have to see. But it costs a lot of money, and they can tell you that this is what it's a factor, a function of. It's all steel, so this will always be 29,000. If you have a wide flange made out of uh, 50 KSI yield steel, then that's just a number. You crunch that number out, it turns out to be 113. If you have a wide flange made out of A36 steel, I'm not sure, you know, why you would do that because it's not going to be as strong. There's going to be a lot more steel involved. But you take E over 36 KSI, times square root times 0.56, and that would be the break point above which you have problems with the local buckling, below which you do not. Here's another thing that can buckle. This is the flange of a wide flange. It's also the flange of a T because T's are cut from wide flanges. Here is the web of a wide flange, and the supported length is right down here, a little bit below where this radius comes out, and right above right there where that radius comes out. And the tendency to buckle is what they call H. You can get H by measuring the depth of the wide flange. You subtract a thing called K. There are two of them in the book. <clears throat> one of them is K sub DES for design, and one of them is K for uh, sub DET for detailing. Detailing, as you might imagine, they tell you that number is usually in sixteenths of an inch, so you can tell whether or not you can get a wrench in there and, and tighten up bolts and stuff like that. You want the design number. It's not hard to tell the difference because one of them is, I don't know, point one oh six and one of them would be plus the flange, and one of them is a sixteenth number. We don't use any things that are sixteenths. Those sixteenths are used to see whether or not you can fit things together. Depending on how long this is, if it's very long, you see how it has a very high lambda? And if it is very thick, it'll have a lower lambda, telling you whether or not it has a high susceptibility or a low susceptibility. The break point for uh, the web, um, yeah, break point for the web is 1.49. This is the break point for the flange. Now, I don't care for it, but everybody says it but me. They call that the upper limit. And what they're really saying is the upper limit below which you're okay. But the upper limit where you're getting ready to not be okay I really like to think of them a lot more like they're break points between bad and good. And it's going to even be more important, I think, when you start getting more than one break point down here. Because it won't be too long before we're going to have some things that go like this, and go like this, and go like this. And you're going to have a break point, you're going to have break points. So I think rather than trying to remember which region you're in, figure the break point and then go get your number, whatever it is for, and see which region you're in. Here are your break points. Page 16.1-16, table B4.1A. Here's what we said. There's that number we just discussed, 0 
that is for flanges of rolled I-shaped sections. Did you guys fix it? <laughs> okay, well, I got my backup. Are these, are those your keys? Oh, okay, thank you. I don't get that. That happened how many times? Five, six? Okay, flanges. Here are your flanges. There's your B over T. Your B stick out is B sub F over 2. That's where you get your uh, B over T is your measurement. Uh, your B sub F over 2, of course, is B and thickness. Here are four webs of doubly symmetric I-shaped sections and channels. That include an uh, uh, S shape or a wide flange. Here is your break point on that one, 1.49. Here's a break point on an angle, B over T. Here are the break point on crosses. Here are the break point on rectangular tubes. Here's the break point on a tube. A tube has a tendency to locally buckle also. Your measurement, your criteria for what do you have in the shape you're requesting is its uh, outside diameter divided by the thickness. And this is uh, no square root on this one. There's a break point below which you're good, above which you'll have to include the effect of local buckling. Yes, sir, it's on page 16.1-16, sure. Typical. There's somebody who wrinkled up the flange. That is local buckling of the flange. Here's one. That's more flange. Here's one. Local buckling of the web. Now, in truth, if you'll notice, rather than actually go buckle something in the flange only and then buckle something else in the web only, they just went and took something made a little short column out of it and squashed it so hard everything in sight buckled. But basically, you see what's happening. This is the problem. You can tell it's not real also because, generally speaking, if you put too much compression across here, one side will tend to go up while the other side will tend to go down. In other words, the whole thing will roll when it is uh, bu local buckling like this. This one is pretty is typical of what you really would see uh, if a web itself buckled. But they wanted to get two and one on that demonstration. Uh, here are typical values. This is in the front of your book, page 1-24 for a 14 by 132 cross-sectional area depth. You would need the depth. You would need to subtract 2 times K design. It's not quite true because anything for convenience these people are going to give you, they're going to give you depth minus K design over 2, and they're going to divide it by the thickness of the web. Somewhere, where's the thickness? There's the thickness of the web. But, you know, you could be asked to check it on an exam, check the number. There's probably one or two wrong in the book. and say, go see what the... H over T sub W is, or H over T, uh, B sub F over T sub W, whatever, and pull the numbers out, and the number in the book could be wrong. But there's your depth. There's your K design. This minus two of these for the web, divided by the thickness of the web. Here's your B sub F right there, divided by two to get the stick out of the wide flange on one side only divided by the thickness of the web, that number there is going to give you a measure of susceptibility to local buckling. But in truth, on the next page, here they are. For that same shape, there's B sub F over 2, divided by the thickness of the flange. For this shape, that's your number. This will have to be compared to a break point. Here is the susceptibility to the web buckling. It says little h. Little h is actually d minus 2k designs. 
it is right there. D minus 2K designs. Here are the numbers calculated out. 17.7. Here's Segui's take. I just put the whole table in there. The same numbers. There is your break point for the flange. There's your break point for the web. Here's for uh, T. This is for uh, the T sticking out. Same as this one. Doesn't have to be. It is. Here for the web, uh, 1.49 versus 0.75. Now, that don't make any sense. Why is D over T 0.75, and this is H over T sub W, what do you think the difference is between a wide flange and a, and a T? They're both made from the same thing. Well, this is a stiffened element. Somebody's holding both ends of it down, and this is an unstiffened element. So this one is more subject to buckling, local buckling. Uh, I don't know. Here's two angles, pair of angles. They're exactly the same, except they got different numbers. Wonder why that is. The gap. That is exactly right. These two have to be bolted together. And then this part here will support each other, and they make a pretty stiff little element, so these things aren't as likely to fail than these here, where they are, they're going to be still bolted together, but they probably have a washer in there like that, and that washer may only occur every, you know, five feet or something like that. These are more susceptible to buckling. So you see here you have a lower number. And the lower number means that further down to the left, you're going to be more susceptible to buckling. If you exceed that number, you'll have to take local buckling into account. An example. Da, 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 da. I like that. That's a nice ringtone. Man, it's better than some I've heard. I hate my dad and I hate my mom and I killed the cat in a blender bomb and a Jeez, man, don't go to an interview with that on your cell phone. Wow. For a W14 by 74, he would like you to investigate local stability. This is lambda U. This is the lambda of the flange. This is the criteria that you were told that you must follow when you look at the table for wide flanges, B over T. Where B is the stick out is B flange over 2, and then T is the thickness. There's B sub F over 2. The thickness of the flange, you can check these numbers out. They're on these pages. And you get 6.41 out of the book, and this says you get 6.43. Numbers change every now and then. Every now and then, all of a sudden, a wide flange will have this much cross-sectional area, and the next book they come out, it's got a little bit different. Those things happen. I'm not exactly sure why. It could, I guess, really be that the, they go out and buy a bunch of them and they measure made by different people and they have slight differences. And so they say, okay, well, this year it's this number. I mean, you don't care. It's not going to change anything. But if you get something like that that's a little off, it shouldn't bother you. You still know what you're doing. It's just they change the numbers. The break point... For case one, for the flange is 0.56 square root of e over f sub y. There's e, there's f sub y. He says, investigate the column of example 4.2. That must have been a 50 KSI steel. 13.5, you are to the left of the break point. In other words, if you were to plot this, and it looked something like this, and here was your break point. 13.5, you are at 6.41, then this is you. Therefore, it is not subject to local buckling for this shape as far as the flange is concerned. <coughs> Here's the web. Lambda for you is the lambda of the web as opposed to the flange. Here it's calculated. You could have looked it up in the book as 25.4. Break point. It's subscripted instead of by U as 
when the radius of gyration pretty well gives this thing problems. Lambda sub bar. <coughs> There's your uh, break point number, and it turns out to be 35.4. Again, you are to the left of this number, and since you're to the left, it is not subject to local buckling, so local instability is not a problem. Now, here he tells you how to correct it if you have local buckling of these elements. You have to, even in this class, know how to tell if it's subjected, if it is subject to local buckling, because what we're going to do is if we find it, we're probably going to avoid that shape, because we don't really have time to cover everything in the book, and this is one of them we don't. It's not that it's not straightforward. They will do it if you go to graduate school. We just don't do it in here. So if you come up and you find that one of these shapes ha is non-slender, in other words, has elements which are subjected, possibly, uh, not possibly, but they will be subjected to local buckling, then we're going to avoid them. We don't have to avoid all of them because one of the things we use in here is we use tables. And they'll tell us how strong something is for various shapes in the table. Well, the guy who did the table, he went to graduate school. He knows how to do this. And so local buckling is included in the table numbers. The only thing is it's not included is if I pick a shape and ask you how strong it is, and you get up to the point where you say, uh, this thing is going to locally buckle. That's going to be the limit. At that point, you're going to have to say, I don't know yet. That takes care of. That's one of the reasons we don't have time. Five pages, ten pages of calculations and derivations. Good stuff. Uh, as soon as they make this a four-hour class, we'll cover that. Quick review. This is global buckling. And the reason I know it's global buckling is because I see that global buckling number. I don't see those numbers that we were talking about a minute ago. This is... Euler's formula right here. This is 0.877 Euler's formula. It's listed in your manual, E3-3. You'll find all this on page 16.1-33. Here's where Euler's, Euler's formula just went astray because he didn't take into account that the fibers were yielding. F critical in this region is 0.877 Euler. F critical in this region is 0.658. F yield, F Euler multiplied times F sub Y. If the yield is 50 and Mr. Euler says 5 million, this is a zero. Anything raised to the zero power is 1. 1 times F sub Y, that makes a lot of sense. That's the critical buckling stress on a 1 inch thick, tall, wide flange. What you do with it once you get the critical buckling stress, you multiply it times the gross area. What does that give you? That give you? The cross-sectional strength, okay. What the nominal strength, and, and I was just looking for that particular technical term. And then to turn it into the design strength, which is okay for you to run the piece of you right up to, is called... Uh, well, it's a resistance factor, okay. What is that for a column buckling? 0. 0.9, that's correct, 0. 0.9. You say, well, I didn't remember all that. Well, you're okay, because we had not had a quiz yet. But pretty soon it's going to matter. You say, well, no, I don't think so, because I'm going to bring my big old thick $100 book. You can find it in the book. You're good to go. But there's a lot of fees in there. If you just flip through, you say, oh, there's a fee, 0. 0.606. Uh, I'll try that one. Tables for compression members so that you don't have to do all this work. All of this work is good stuff. Got a lot of useful things. They'll tell you the global flexural buckling strength. They're on page 4-322, for example. That may be in the middle of the table, maybe the beginning. I don't remember where. 
They are referred to as column load tables. They'll tell you the selected strength. But they always, any of these design aids are going to always include the resistance factor. So be careful with that. If you work out the strength of your column and you've got the nominal strength there and then you go look in the table, they won't be the same because you forgot to put the fee in there. Use of the table is illustrated in the following example. I'll take your word for it. It says he wants to compute the available strength of the compression member of example 4-2. That was a 14 by 74, 20 feet long. We had already calculated uh, for that 20-foot thing. We went and got the minimum radius of gyration about the weak axis. 20 foot times 12 divided by the radius of gyration about the yy axis. It was a pen pen column. It was a 1. I'm just reminding you. I'm sure you remember all that. Turned out to be 96.67. What are the units of this thing? That's correct. She's shaking her head the right direction. Her head's going like this. No units. Because it's a ratio. It's an inches over inches times a factor. And the gross area was 21.8. So it's on page 120. Uh, here it's where he repeated all the numbers. I wonder where I could grab them and see them. Uh, he says, we have tables for your pleasure for phi sub C F critical, table 422. Uh, don't, that's, my guess is, this is the page. That's my page, that's his page. I got, got it coming up on the next page. They're only given for integer values of slenderness ratio. You can take your choice. You can just go ahead and pick out the little bit more severe number, or you can interpolate. Uh, that's not my job to teach you teach you how to interpolate. Uh, I think, did you all already put your homework problem in there? Yeah? Okay. Well, you can give that to her and she can give you the homework problems to hand back. Uh, here's what the table, well, this is the table for where I was getting the numbers from. There's a 14 by 74. I got a couple of pages of that invariably. Here is your area. Here is your uh, x-axis radius of gyration. Here's your y-axis radius of gyration. We took the 2.48, and we calculated KL over R for it. Here's the table under discussion. Table 4-22. You must do your own slenderness ratio check. Just knowing how much stress you can put on a 50 KSI piece of steel doesn't include the fact if that 50 KSI piece of steel has uh, slender elements. So you're welcome to use this, but the slender element check must be done after you use this to see how strong your column is. This is not including the slender elements possibility. Um, if the KL over R, we got page after page of this, that was a 50 KSI piece of steel, Here's a KL over R is a 1. I don't think that's where we're going. What was the KL over R? 96 or something like that? So I'm looking for the KL over R of around 96. Here we go. Here's another summary. The KL over R was 96.77. I don't want this column. That's a loud stress. There's phi sub C F critical for 50 KSI steel. These are based on the equation 3, 2, and 3, 3 on this page. He knows when you're above or below a break point. Do you remember what the break point was for our, for our uh, 50 KSI steel? Global buckling? I mean, that's really getting down and dirty to ask you that. It was 113. In other words, if you multiplied... Uh, 4.71 times the square root of 29,000 KSI divided by 50 KSI, you got 113. So that's the break point. He knows when the break point occurs. So he knows when to use one equation below the break point, and he knows when to use one above. He knows which one to use. Our slenderness ratio is 96 point something right in between 22.6, 22.9.
If you interpolate, you get 22.67, including the fee. If you'd rather, you can just take the lower permitted stress and not bother interpolating. And in this class, you most certainly can't because, like I say, not my job to teach you how to interpolate, and I know you know how to do it, so I don't care. So if you just want to go to the nearest, the next lighter one, the next uh, lesser permitted stress, then that would be okay. Here are more pages where the kale of R is higher than 113 and more of them. Remember, no slender element check is being done in these tables. Now let's see where he went ahead and used that. Maybe it was back on the previous page. That's local buckling, slender element, a web or a flange. All right, so here's what he got. He got out of the table, 22.67, interpolating. Then he says, then my final answer for how much load you can have is area gross I remember seeing that 21.8 square inches out of the table times the critical buckling stress we got of the table, 22.67, including the fee sub C. <clears throat> that includes the fee. So there's a real tendency to put another fee on there. I want to do that. That multiplied together gives you 494 kips of load. Now, we don't know what the load request was, but whatever it is has to be less than 494. And he says there's a second set of tables which will include the shape itself rather than just talking about the steel because you still now have to see if the 494 is acceptable by checking slenderness ratios of the web and the flange of that shape. This column load table was done by somebody who knows how to do that. If they are slender elements, he'll do that 18 pages of work for you before he goes into the table. Because this is not theory, learn how to do it day. That book you bought there, that's do it real world, let's get on with it. Column load tables are in part four. They're on page 4-16, for example, probably the one we're going to use. And I got it back in 131E. Here is a typical, well, it's not typical, it's the one he asked for. So 14 by 74 again. Here's your 14 by. The 16s are in the preceding pages. The 10 bys are in the later pages. Here's a 14 by 74. This is allowed stress design. It's easy to get in the wrong table. This is your... KL, the R is already in there. He knows how to calculate the, the R. Your length was 20 feet, and your K was what? One. Why was it one? There's only one way it would be a one, because the column is what? How is it supported? Depend on both ends. That's right. Look at everybody looking at you ugly. They're not looking at you ugly because you're brilliant. They're looking at you ugly say, the longer we wait, the less we have to memorize. Shh. Don't answer his questions. KL was 20 feet. And so all you do is you go across till you find a 14 by 74, and you get the same number, 495. Yes, sir. Uh, the K values, I can't know. I'm sorry. I told you in the last class, if you look through there, some way. Thank you. I just really, you know, I've got it, but I don't think I've seen it in this set. So we'd have to, I'd have to go back to a previous uh, set. I will say that as you go through your notes, or as you go through these notes, I've tried everywhere to mark, you know, where those pages appear. All right, so 495 is a done deal. Well, wait a minute. I don't know if it's a done deal. It could be that that has slender elements. Don't care. You said a minute ago you cared. Well, a minute ago I wasn't dealing with the 14 by 74 shape. I was just dealing by anybody 
was made out of 50 KSI steel, which incidentally, the problem with these tables, they're not good for anything but 50 KSI steel. And when you go to the angles, you'll find they don't have anything but 36 KSI steel because that's what we usually use for those kind of things. So that's why he knows where the break point is, and that's why he knows what this number is, and uh, that's why our value checked to also, because he's obvious this must not have slender elements, because if it did, this number using that F-critical table would give us the wrong answer, which we would know that it was going to. Now, you want to know who really does have column problems, thin elements? Uh, 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 there's a guy that's got column problems. Right there, if that's made out of 50 KSI steel, that little C superscript there means this guy's got slender elements. Therefore, many of these numbers, not the short fat ones, but the long, slender ones are going to be affected. These numbers will be changed. They'll be reduced because they have uh, local buckling. Here's, here's what he says. C is. Shape is slender for compression with F sub Y is 50 KSI. Heavy line indicates uh, K over R equal to a greater than 200. He's saying, for heaven's sakes, he really shouldn't be working in this region. I'm not even going to tell you how much load there is going to carry because it's just not good. To be able to carry 500, 400, 300 kips, you're already down to 100. Below that, he suggests you don't go. It's not against the law. It's very uneconomical. Quick review, analysis of columns. Here are your E3 equations, E3-1 and E3-2, E3-3, E3-4. One of them gives you phi, one of them gives you this, one of them gives you that, one gives you below the breakpoint, one gives above the breakpoint. They're all right there. In our notes, there they are. Here are, here's table 422. It's a great little table. The only problem is it is not going to be able to cover the slenderness slenderness of the elements because you don't know which element you're working with. You don't know which one. It covers all common F sub Y. That's what's nice. Whereas the tables down there, they only cover specific F sub Y for those kind of shapes normally used. Lambda sub R, not checked for slender elements, but all shapes are covered. And this one, only a few shapes are covered. You go back to those tables, you find out they run out of things in a hurry. Uh, there aren't any 8 bys. There aren't any 21 by 50, uh, 150 shapes and things like that. Because they're not commonly used for commons, uh, columns. That's why his excuse for not putting another 200 pages and charging you another $50 and give you a dolly with the book. Uh, the values in the table based on global buckling and these equations, local stability is assumed, and you must not exceed the slenderness ratios. Now, this is, I think, badly written. Above this line, he's talking about one thing. He's talking about table 4-22. And he says, well, I told him I was doing that. Yeah, but then you said all those some shapes and so-and-so. You didn't really tell them. We're talking a major change in thought here. This is table 422, and these are out of the column load tables. So here he's warning you that you got to check for excessive width to thickness ratios. And here he's talking about the column load tables. He says, in here, the tabulated strength has been computed according to the requirements of members with slender elements and no further checking is needed. They're good to go. They include that. Design. Design becomes quite easy with the tables. That's not quite easy. Very few people on earth can do it, but you and me. To get an economical shape, here's what you do. You'll be using table 4-1, and it's on page 4-12. He would like you to design a compression member uh, for a service load of 165 dead, 535 live, 26 feet long, pinned on each end. He wants A992. 
I don't know. Is that 50 KSI steel? It better be because I'm not going to be able to use the tables otherwise. I'm going to find out if that's 50 KSI steel. In the buck. That's exactly right. And he wants you to pick a 14 by shape. So just play in the 14K shapes. Load, 1.2 dead, 1.6 live. There's your piece of use, 1054 kips. you got to give me something stronger than that, nominally times a resistance factor bigger than that number. From the column load tables, we go to the column load tables. This is the 14 by page. I'm going to start with a, ooh, I don't like that one. Oh, I don't mind that one. What's wrong with this one? got slender. You don't have to check. It's got slender elements. You're in the tables where the check has been made and corrections have been made. You have to go down to a 26-foot column. You need 1054. Eh, eh, eh. Nope, 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 nope. See how they're getting fatter? See how they're getting heavier, stronger? Go to the next page. 26 feet. I need 1054. No, 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 no. 1054. That'll work. A W14 by 132. Look in your book. It says a W14 by 145. What he forgot to do was a W14 by 145 used to be the right answer because this number was 1050 in the last, in the 13th edition of the AISC manual. Call them up and ask them why they added a little bit. You remember a little while ago where they changed the R design a little bit and they changed the H over H sub W a little bit? You know, I don't know if they got better numbers uh, or what, but it doesn't matter. If they're going to let me have the other 10 kips, I'll take it. If all of a sudden I get to drop a size from 145 to 132 legally uh, and know it won't fall down, I'll take it. Here, incidentally, is the old edition, the old 13th edition. Look at that, 1050. You need, but you needed 1054. New edition, you can live with a smaller shape. Now then, if I ask you to design something without being stuck in the 14-inch region, we just say that this one is 24 feet long, and you need a load of 275, the same columns. I'd go to 24 feet. I'm looking for 275. No, 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 no. And I turn to the next page. Oh, those were eight buys. Look at that. None of those eight buys worked. They were all bummers. 275. Now I'm in the 10 buys. No, 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 no. Yes, 275. A W10 by 54. Is it, does it have slender elements? No. None of these have slender elements. Not that it matters. That's still a good number. So the lightest one I got so far is a W10 by 54. Remember that? Now let's go to the 12 buys. Here are the 12 buys. 275, no, 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 no. 292. Uh, that weighs more. I'll stick with the one I had. A 10 by 58. Let's look in the 14 buys. 14 buys. Need 275, 275. There we go. 61. That doesn't look like I'm going to win. You know, I'll check them all because you never know. There's something else may show up. But a 14 by, that's all I got. Either that or I got tired of doing it and maybe hopefully checked the other ones, but they weren't, uh, they didn't work. There's your lightest column shape right there. You say, why didn't you just show me that on the first day we got here in class? I could have done that. You could have, but you wouldn't have had any idea in the world what was going on. That's why. All right, see you next time. Sorry, Ben. You can ask my guys. The dang thing went off 20 times.
Uh, no, don't, no, no. I don't know what you're getting ready to turn off, but it's, it's still recording, and if I don't get out gracefully, I lose the lecture. I'll get it. Thank you. Here, if you'll haul that back. Yeah, back wherever we got it from. Somebody in another class is probably sitting in it.